Shalom. Today we are continuing Intermediate Hebrew, Lesson 3, uh, continuing and translating the book of Hosea. Uh, going over again, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, V'tahar od, and she conceived again, V'teled bat, and she gave birth to a daughter, V'yomer lo, and he said to him, that is, Yudhe said to Hosea, Kra Shema, call her name Lo Ruchama, no mercy, no pity. So we are reviewing several meanings from Tanakh about what exactly this kind of mercy is. Ki Lo Osir Od, I will not continue any more, Arachem, to have mercy at Bet Yisrael on the house of Israel. Ki naso esa lahem, and we'll discuss that phrase in a moment. So we have already said that rachem, rechem, is another word for womb, and it's this kind of mercy that he is talking about. One more example we see from Breshit Mem Gimel, Pasuk Shlashim, uh, Genesis 43, verse 30. Viyimaher Yosef, and he hurried Yosef. Ki nichmeru. Let's look at this root. The root chamar means to be hot or to burn. We see it here in the nifal. It's like burning inside of him. Uh, what? This rachamav, this mercy, uh, his mercy that he has, el achiv, for his brother. He's uh, He's with the brothers. He's with Benjamin. It's the first time for them to sit down together. And Joseph is just consumed with this emotion, this burning emotion that he has for his brother. V'yivakesh l'fkot, and he is uh, requesting to cry. V'yavo ha'chadra, and he goes into the, uh, inside the room. V'yevk shama. So, uh, one thing I see in these slides as we're cutting and pasting from the internet is the dagesh for the yud is on the wrong side of the yud. I just want to uh, make you aware of that. The dagesh belongs inside the little hook to the left of the hook of the yud. I see also that in the key uh, there are two dagesh and um, this is not anything that exists. So that's just uh, a phenomenon of the cutting and pasting. Sorry about that. We have this form, uh, Yevk, uh, and he cried. He cried there. So uh, it's a little difficult to pronounce, and again, it's a bit unusual. We don't uh, ordinarily have a dogish in a kaf sofit, but it does occur, and this is an example. So it makes it a little bit difficult to, to pronounce. Vayevk. The root to cry, Bacha, is bet kaf he. And so we have this phenomenon that happens in the third person, masculine singular, vav conversive, imperfect. We have some other examples. For example, when you see the verb see, ro'e, ra'a, in this form, and he, it looks like he will see, but because of the vav, the tense reverses, and so we translated it, we translate it as, and he saw. So because it ends in he, uh, it's in this third person masculine, he will do something. It loses the he at the end. So it goes from ra'a to v'yar. Uh, another example is the verb asa, which also ends in he. Uh, if, if it would just be he will do something, it would be ya'ase, and we would see the he. But when we have the vav, we lose the hay at the end and becomes vayas. This is only for biblical Hebrew. This doesn't take place in modern Hebrew. So that is how we get to the form vayevk. Bacha loses the hay at the end in the third person, masculine, singular, vav, uh, conversive. We have this form uh, towards the end of the verse, naso esa. So that's, this is what this verb, uh, this verb pair looks like grammatically. It's a very common form. The naso is the absolute infinitive. The root for the verb is nun sin aleph. 
And then we have a conjugated form, esa. This is conjugated for the first person singular, I will. Uh, the place where we see this uh, initially is back in Genesis, where God is talking to Adam. He says, you will surely die. And that's how these things are translated. Mot tamut. Mot is the absolute infinitive. Tamot, you will die. So it's a very common form in the Hebrew, this kind of double verbs, the absolute infinitive plus the conjugated form. And it's translated as you will surely, or whoever it is, I will surely, whatever the verb is. The verb naso can mean to, uh, to pick up, to carry, to bear, to lift up, to lift up the face, to lift up the eyes. It also is used for the person who bears the sin which can be the person who commits the sin, or it can be God. If God is uh, carrying the sin, then he's forgiving the people. But in this case, in the context of Hosea, I think we have to see that God is going to carry the people away into captivity. Moving on to uh, verse 7, Hosea chapter 1. The et beit Yehuda and the house of Yehuda arachim, I will have mercy. The ho shatim. So this is the verb. Yesha, as in Yeshua, salvation, I will save. It's conjugated for the first person, the T, Hosha T, and the Mem at the end is for them. I will save them. The verb here is conjugated in a Hephiel form. Uh, we lose the Yud and we get this He from the Hephal, Hephiel. So on the right hand column, you see what would be the perfect tense. Hoshati, Hoshata, Hoshat, uh, and so forth. In the left hand column, we see the participle form. Participle he feel verbs always start with mem, Moshia, Moshia. Participle he feel feminine forms always have that ah ending, the kamats and the hey. They never take a tav ending. So, for example, in the pa'al, if you have shomer, then the feminine form is shomeret, uh, but we never see that in the he feel. If, for example, in pa'al you have ose, then you have ose osa, and the feminine form is the kamatz and the he, and that's what you always have in he feel. Moshi'a, and then you would have moshi'im and moshi'ot. So these are the, uh, the perfect and the participle form. Returning to the text, Hoshatim, I will save them. Be Yehovah Elohehem, by Yehovah their God. Velo Oshiem, and I will not save them. So here you see the conjugation in the imperfect. We lose the Yud again. We don't have any He, we have Aleph. Oshia, Toshia, Toshii, uh, and so forth. Again, the mem at the end is them, but I will not save them. Bekeshet, by the bow, we've already discussed it. Uvacher, by the sword. Uva milchama, or by war. Besusim, by horses. Uva farashim, which is translated as horse men, horse riders. Uh, it's used many times in Tanakh, and that is the translation. So we will look at that root. The root parash, perishin, means to divide. And you are familiar with some words already. Uh, when we talk about the Torah portion, it's the parasha. It's divided. The Torah is divided into sections that we read. Each one is called a parasha. You know about the parushim. They are the Pharisees. And they divided themselves from the rest of the community of Israel. They felt like they were not living, uh, the rest of the community was not living a ho holy life, a Torah observant life, and so they separated themselves to live a more holy life. Here is an example of, uh, of this root again in Yechezkel, Lamedale, Pasuk Shnei Mesre, Ezekiel, chapter 34, verse 12. Ke edro. As in the visiting of the shepherd of his flock. Let's just uh, go uh, sideways for a minute and look at this root for vakarat, for visit, vakar. You probably know this root in terms of the word boker, which means morning. Morning is the time 
is defined as a time at when you can distinguish someone coming towards you from so many paces, whether they are a man or a woman. So it's a very, very, very early light and be a, being able to distinguish them. So the root of bakar comes to mean to distinguish. So the uh, shepherd or the whoever is the ranchero, he's taking care of the, the cattle. He's going to be coming to look over his cattle to distinguish uh, which ones he's going to breed together, which ones he's going to put someplace else, which ones he's going to sell. So the idea of visiting in order to distinguish the cattle, that is what we're looking at in this Ezekiel verse. Okay, when is he coming? Biyom Hayoto. Hayoto is from Haya. It's the absolute uh, infinitive. Uh, and the O is, is his. The day of his being, Betoch Tono, in the midst of his son, his sheep, Nifrashot. And so here this is translated as scattered. Ken uh, Avakir, thus I will visit at Sonni, my flock, Behitzalti at him, and I will save them from Natsal, Mikol Hamikamot, from all the places, Asher Nafotsusham, they are uh, scattered there, Biyom Anan Ba'arafel, in the day of cloud and darkness. So we see here this paras, it's also a nifal. It's a passive form. The sheep are scattered. They're divided in all many places. So how does this root paras to be divided come to apply to the horse men? Uh, there are two ideas. One is the overall look of the horse as he's really running, how his legs divide. We just have a picture of that, the racing of the horse legs. Uh, another idea is that, that that is the job of the horse riders in the midst of the battle would be to ride through the uh, soldiers on the ground, the infantry, and divide them up so they are no longer effective fighting force. So that's just two ideas. But it is always translated, this farashim is always translated as horsemen in Tanakh. Moving on to verse 8. Matigmol et l'ruchama and she weaned the daughter lo ruchama v'tahar v'teled ben, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. Again, this weird double dogish in the bet. This just that's something that doesn't exist, so don't worry about it. Let's look at the root gamal. A gamal, as you know, is a camel, and um, it's also the letter gimel, and this goes to the idea of uh, the legs and the walking but it's also translated as to wean. It comes to, uh, it's used in other places as the idea of receiving a reward. So in the context of the culture, you can understand how a camel is a good reward. It's a valuable animal. And uh, what is the reward when you are weaned? You get to eat food. Moving on to verse nine. Vayomer, and he said, again, yud heh to uh, Hoshea, he's telling him, Kra Shema, call his name, Lo Ami, not my people. Ki Atem, because you all, Lo Ami, are not my people. Va'anochi, Lo Ehye Lachem, and I am no longer for you. I will not be for you on your behalf. Here we have a discrepancy uh, between the traditional English translations, uh, other translations, and, um, and the Hebrew uh, Bible in terms of the verse numbers. Here, at this verse, the Hebrew goes on to chapter 2. The other translations are staying in chapter 1 for a few more verses. By the end of chapter 2, they'll catch up with each other. Uh, we're going to work from the Hebrew numbering here. Behaya mispar b'nei Yisrael, and it will be the number of the children of Israel, kachol hayam, as the sand of the sea. So the kaf here is the preposition like, similar to, and chol is sand. 
This is a bit confusing because there is a modern Hebrew word, kachol, which means blue. Um, if you're interested in understanding how these things go together, uh, you can go to the series of All the Colors of the Rainbow and listen to the blue series. But in the Bible, biblical blue is called techelet. And so here we are looking at a preposition k like, and chol, sand. Kachol hayam, like the sand of the sea. Asher lo yimad, which is not measured. Velo yisafer which is not counted. So we see we have the word mispar, which is number, and yisafer, which is counted. But there's a little bit of confusion in these conjugations. Let's look at that. So this root, samich peresh, means to count in the pa'al and to recount in the pl. To recount means to tell a story. You are probably familiar with the word sefer, which means book. Let's just look at the conjugations. For the third person, masculine, singular, imperfect, he will. Yispor means he will count. Yisaper means he will recount. He will tell a story. He will recount a story. Yisaper is the nifal means he will be counted. So we're talking uh, nifal is a passive form. The sand is not doing anything. Someone else is counting the sand. This is the meaning of passive. So the sand is being counted. In this case, it cannot be counted because there's so much of it. Bahaya bimkom, and it will be in that place. Asher ye amer. This is the same nifal form, the same conjugation uh, as the yisaper. It will be said from the verb amar to say. It will be said, said to them or of them, Lo ami, you are not my people, Atem, you, you are not my people. Ye amer, it will be said, Lahem, to them, Bene el chai, you are sons of the living God. And a bit of a side note, it has been taught that the Bene el chai is equivalent to the 153 fish of John 21, 11. We know that there is nothing without significance in any of the Tanakh or Brit Chadashah. It's a bit of a curious number, 153. Many people have tried to figure it out, and there are many explanations. One of the things that has been taught is that the Bnei El Chai uh, is equivalent to the Bnei Ha Elohim. Bnei El Chai only adds up to 110, but Bnei Ha Elohim adds up to the 153. So the question becomes, are the Bnei El Chai the same as the Bnei Ha Elohim? Uh, if you look and find the places where it actually talks about Bnei Ha Elohim, you will find that it's mentioned uh, twice in Genesis 6 uh, concerning the uh, Nephilim and uh, the Bnei Ha Elohim that were uh, taking the daughters of, of women, of men. It's mentioned twice in Job at the beginning and also once at the end. Um, it does not appear in those cases. It might be mentioned one other time in Psalms. Um, it does not appear in those cases that they, Beneha Elohim, are human beings. But I'll leave you to figure that out. There are a lot of other explanations about the 153, but uh, this presentation is not about that. We'll have to do that another time. Moving on to verse 2, v'nikbetsu. Again, this is a nifal form. It's a passive form. Uh, you already have a context for this root. Kavatz means to gather. You know the word kibbutz in Israel. This is a collective farm where the people gather to work together. So they are being gathered. Who? B'nai Yehuda, the, the sons or children of Judah, of Yisrael, and the sons of Israel, yachdav together. Besamu lahem, and they will set for themselves rosh echad, one head, one leader. Va'alu min ha'aretz, and they will come up from the earth. Ki gadol yom Yisrael, because great is the day of Jezreel. This is not a form of Yisrael of Israel. This is Jezreel. We talked about it when we when he was born and uh, who he is and what his name means. So next week, 
we'll continue on. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Shalom.